Turn in your Bibles to Luke 18. We're going to be in Romans 10 uh, this morning, but I want to start, um, like we have been the last few weeks, with the parable of Jesus. So, Luke 18, turn in your Bibles, and while you're turning there, let me explain to you uh, what my job is this morning. (laughs) My job this morning, as I see it, is to convince you that you can't be saved by faith. I know that sounds heretical, but hold your tomatoes. Trust me, you can't be saved by faith. Only by faith in Christ. You see, every person, every religion, every belief system has faith. They believe in certain things. They trust in certain things. So you can't be saved just by faith in any old thing. You can only be saved by faith in Christ. We as Christians, we say that faith is very important. We say even that faith Faith is the means by which somebody can be reconciled back to God. So it's not just another belief for us. It's actually the key factor. Faith, trusting Christ, is the key factor that's involved in our salvation. So it's important that we understand it. We are saved by faith in Christ. We're saved by faith, but it has to be the right type of faith. That's the title of the sermon this morning, is the right type of faith. Now, Jesus illustrates this beautifully, as he always does, in a parable in Luke 18. We're going to pick up in verse 9. So Luke 18, 9 is where we're going to start this morning. And it explains the context. Verse 9 says that Jesus told this parable to some who were trusting in themselves. They had faith all right. Faith in themselves. Trusted in themselves that they were righteous and then they looked down on everyone else. Jesus said, verse 10, this is a hypothetical, this is a uh, fictional story, a parable that he used to drive his point home. Jesus said, two men went up to the temple complex to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying something like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. No, I'm different. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. He certainly had faith. Faith in himself. But verse 13, look at this. The tax collector, standing uh, afar off, he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, but he kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath from me. I am a sinner. Jesus concludes, verse 14, I tell you, this one, this tax collector, he went down to his house justified rather rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, both men had faith. Both men were trusting in something, but the Pharisee was trusting. He had faith in the wrong thing. Faith can't save you. Only faith in Christ can save you. Well, we're right in the middle of a a series. This is the fourth week of a seven-week series where we're studying the heart of God. We're doing this through uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Uh, Paul wrote Romans 9, 10, and 11. And as we've seen, there's some (laughs) meaty things in these chapters. There is some theology in there. There's some doctrine in there. But I think mostly what these chapters are about are about, it's about people. It's about specifically God's love for people. God is a person, us as persons. It's about people. It's about relationships. It's about what He has done, how He has crafted together, orchestrated out a plan to rescue us as people, to rescue the human race. 
So these three chapters are, to me, they're, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, they're deep. <laughs> but I think as we dig deep, the payoff is great. Because we get to see God's heart. We get to see what He has done. Actions speak louder than words. And we get to see what God has done to work out this plan of salvation for us. And one of my goals is, as I've said, is that as we study these three chapters, that as you see what God has done, that you would come to love God even more as you see what He has done for us. So turn to Romans 10. We'll pick up. We're going to work through the first 13 verses of Romans chapter 10 this morning. If you remember the the context here, what the early church was struggling with was this question. They they wondered, many of the in the early church were wondering, what what is going on here? This, this, um, This new plan of salvation that came through Israel, through the Israelites, Jesus and his disciples, this started off as a, as a Jewish movement, but now uh, the, the Jews have pretty much rejected it. So many of God's chosen people, the Israelites, they weren't being a part of this new salvation in Christ. But yet, at the same time, many non-Israelites were. Many Gentiles were. So what's going on here? People were seeing this unfold and they were coming to the wrong conclusion about God's heart. They were, they were thinking things like God was had rejected his people, that God had, had broken his promises to his people, that God was being unfair even. So Paul was taking these three chapters to explain what was going on so that there wouldn't be any confusion about God's heart in the matter. We've seen that Paul has explained that, first of all, God has the right to choose who to forgive and who not to forgive. He's never promised that uh, even the national blessings that Israel had had experienced in the Old Testament, even those weren't based on physical descent. Many of the Israelites thought that they should be forgiven automatically because they were Israelites. And Paul explained using Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau as examples that, look, even even the national blessings weren't based on physical descent, so there's no reason to think these new spiritual, this salvation blessing would be based on physical descent either. God has the right to choose who to forgive. We can't presume upon God and say, God, you must forgive me because I am X, Y, Z, whatever it is, fill in the blank. We can't presume upon God's forgiveness that way. He has the right to choose. Well, is it fair then, some were struggling with this, is it fair then that, that God would choose to forgive some but not others? And we saw Paul deal with this situation and he explained, look, we, we don't want God to deal with us in a fair way. I mean, if God dealt with us solely on fairness, none of us would experience His mercy. Paul quoted from the Old Testament where after the uh, golden calf incident, God was going to wipe out all of the Israelites. But after Moses uh, repented and prayed to God on behalf of the people, God chose, He said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. So He didn't even deal with Israel on a fair basis. He had mercy on them. And Paul quotes that to say the same thing today. God has a right to choose to have mercy, but he doesn't have to. It is his choice to have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Second, God is free to choose the conditions for forgiveness. He has the right to choose the basis for deciding who will be forgiven and who won't. He is free. He has the right to choose these conditions. And I'm, Frank, I'm glad that he did not choose to forgive based on physical descent. Praise God that he didn't choose to forgive on that basis. Praise God that he didn't choose to forgive based on some sort of works. I mean, we know we're all sinners, but he could have said something to the effect of, well, I'll forgive those who maybe haven't sinned as, as much as others. I'm glad he didn't. I wouldn't have any hope. Thank God he didn't choose that way. 
No, God chose, I believe the Bible teaches that God chose to forgive anyone, anybody, Jew, Gentile, whoever, who puts their faith in Christ. We see that. This is why I chose these verses from our series for our theme verses. One from chapter 11 and one from chapter 10. Romans 11.32 says that God has imprisoned all of us in disobedience. In other words, he's put us all in the same category. <laughs> he hasn't said, well, these, these, everybody's, these are a little bit better than these. We'll put them in different categories. And I'll forgive these guys because they're not quite as bad, but I'm not going to forgive them. Whoa, look at what they've done. No, he's put us all in the same category of being sinners, some worse than others, of course, but all sinners. He's imprisoned us all in the same category. Why? So that he may have mercy on all. It's a good thing that he's put us all in this category. For verse chapter 10, verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I would say, based on my study of the Scripture, that God's choice of who to save is conditional, based on their response to God's grace. He forgives those who put their faith in Christ. But... And this is what Paul has explained so far in Romans 9. That God has the right to punish and even harden those who choose to reject Him. We've seen this, uh, the classic example is Pharaoh in the Old Testament. Where Pharaoh rejected God, resisted His grace, and so Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then God confirmed. Uh, God let him have what he wanted. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's the same thing with Israel. It's not that God has rejected His people, it's that they rejected His offer. And as Paul explained in Romans 9, God, as the potter, He has the right to set Israel aside, to set aside. They are clay in His hands, and He has the right to set them aside. Their future, as we've seen, will be determined by how they respond to His grace. His offer. We also saw that it's true that God's righteousness is displayed when He punishes evil. I mean, we've seen that. We know that to be the case. The Scripture teaches that. When He punishes evil, uh, just by the process of doing that, He demonstrates His righteousness. When He punishes unrighteousness, His righteousness is highlighted. That just happens when he punishes evil. His righteousness is demonstrated in that action. But, and here's the remarkable thing, and this is what fills us with joy. This is what Paul was so excited about. Even though that's the case, God wants to demonstrate his righteousness in a different way. And so he worked this marvelous plan together so that he could demonstrate his righteousness, but do so in another way. We see this in God's heart. We see because of God's heart for us, because He loves us, He put together this plan to demonstrate His righteousness while at the same time rescuing us from our evil. This is God's heart. Take a look at the first verse for today. You're in Romans 10. Look at verse 1. Romans 10, 1. says, brothers, Paul's writing, he says, brothers, my, heart, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. Now this is Paul expressing her, his heart, but as we've seen, Paul's heart is merely a reflection of God's heart. Because all throughout the Scripture, as you see from these three verses, all throughout the Scripture, God explicitly says this is his heart. This is God's concern. This is God's desire for Israel as well that they would be saved. In the Old Testament, he says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Israel, turn from your wicked ways and live. This is God's heart. God says in the New Testament that he wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In Peter, this is actually 2 Peter. If you're taking notes, I put a typo. It's not 1 Peter, it's 2 Peter. But there, Peter explains 
that the reason God, sometimes we cry out to God, God, come and fix things. God, make things right. Come and judge evil. Right now, in this world, correct the things that are going on in these countries and in our own lives. Fix these things. And Peter explains the reason God doesn't come in judgment yet is because He's patient. He's waiting. He doesn't want anybody to perish but for all to come to repentance. So this is the heart of God. Yes, punishing evil demonstrates His righteousness, but He wanted to do it another way. And as the potter, here's the thing, as the potter, God has the right to even take our evil choices, the things that we choose, even the the choice of rejecting Him. He's able as the potter to take those evil choices and to orchestrate a plan and use them to bring about something good. He did this with Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh's choice to reject God, reject his offer? God used that, even hardened him in his choice, and used Pharaoh then to display his wonders in Egypt. He used Pharaoh's rejection of him to display and demonstrate in a greater way his might and power as he rescued his people from Egypt. It's the same thing with the Israelites now. God took their choice, their evil choice, to crucify their own Messiah. Probably the the worst, most evil choice that's ever been made. To crucify and kill and murder their own Savior, King, Messiah. God took that evil choice that they made and He used it to offer through the cross salvation for everyone. God is the potter of this whole situation, can even take our evil choices and use them to accomplish His plan. Though, as we saw last week though, though forgiveness is offered to all, you must come on His terms. See, that's the thing. Most of the Israelites weren't being saved because they were coming with the wrong wedding clothes on. You remember that parable that Jesus told about the wedding invitation? How it ended with this almost seemed like a bizarre situation where somebody showed up without the right wedding clothes on and they were thrown out and it seemed harsh. And In the story, we don't understand the culture back then, but the application is it's, it's to illustrate people who try to come to God dressed in their own righteousness. It doesn't work. If you're going to come to God, you have to come on His terms. You can't come dressed in your own righteousness, only in the righteousness of Christ that we receive freely when we put our faith in Him. So why weren't most of God's chosen people experiencing this new salvation, but many Gentiles were? Well, as we've seen, God has the right to choose who to forgive and the right to choose to set the terms of forgiveness. Most of the Israelites weren't coming on God's terms, but many Gentiles were. And as we'll see this morning now, as Paul continues to answer this question, many of the Jews were putting their faith in the wrong thing. They were putting their faith in their own righteousness, whereas many Gentiles, by God's grace, were putting their faith in Christ. That's why it's so important for us to understand faith. That's why we spend so much time talking about faith, studying about faith. Because not only do we need to understand it for ourselves, but we need to be so well versed in understanding what faith really is so that when we explain it to others, they understand. It's not enough just for us to understand you know, you think about this in, in school with students and stuff. It's, it's one thing just to um, uh, hear something, hear the teacher and their explanation and say, oh, I understand that. That's not enough. What do we do? We have students write papers or give speeches because we want them to put it in their own words and make sure that they understand it so well that they can communicate it to others because that, that takes the understanding to another level. It's the same thing with the gospel. Not only do we need to understand what faith is for ourselves, We need to understand it so well that we can clearly communicate it to others. What is this thing we call faith in Christ? Well, that's what Paul is going to lay out for us this morning. What is the right type 
of faith. You can pull out your sermon insert in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along with this outline. But this is what we're going to be running through as we cover these 13 verses. The first point is that there's a wrong type of faith. We're going to see Paul's explanation of that. Then we're going to see that faith in Christ is within reach. It's not some mystical experience. It's not some hike up a mountain or go visit a wise man or some great thing you have to accomplish or get struck by lightning. Faith is is right there in your grasp. The third thing Paul is going to do is just explain simply how to have faith, how to choose, how to make that decision of faith. And the last thing, number four, we'll see this morning is that these promises of faith in Christ are offered to everyone. So let's start with the first set of verses here. We're going to pick up in verse 2. We've seen verse 1 already. So you're in Romans 10. Let's look at verse 2. Romans 10.2. Paul says, I can testify about them. He's talking about the Israelites. I can testify about them. I know they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Because they have disregarded the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. He wrote in the Old Testament, the one who does these things must live by them. Sometimes I ask myself, maybe you ask yourself this as well, um, or maybe some of you, you know, may ask me, why, why are we studying Romans in such detail? I mean, sometimes it feels like we're almost going letter by letter, word by word through the book of Romans. Why? Sometimes maybe it gets, feels like we get bogged down in some of this minutia. Why, why are we doing this type of study? Well, what I do to remind myself of, of this um, is I think about the Reformation. We're familiar with the Reformation took place almost 500 years ago. Right? Because that, in that time, during the Middle Ages, the, the concept of faith had been muddied. The concept of uh, the truth from the Scripture of, of salvation by faith alone, faith in Christ alone, had gotten confused. And even, even many people in the church at that time were, were confused again and thinking that they had to earn their salvation by works. But praise God for men and women and the Reformation who studied their Scripture and, in a sense, rediscovered this truth that's here. That salvation is by faith in Christ alone. And we think of all the millions, probably billions of people who have been saved because of the Reformation. And you think, wow, now I see the application. <laughs> I mean, what's more applicable than billions of people being saved because they understand how to come to God on His terms. Salvation by faith in Christ alone. Well, do you know how the Reformation started? Do you know what the the spark that got the whole thing going was? It was Martin Luther systematically teaching through the book of Romans. So you ask, why do we do this? Why do we study it like this? Well, it's because not only reformers, not only pastors, but all of us need to understand exactly what God is saying to study. And I hope you are studying on your own. You're reading through Romans 9, 10, and 11 on your own to understand this thing called faith and so that we can apply it to ourselves and then so we can clearly communicate it to the world. Paul says that they had a zeal, the Israelites, and he knew this from his own personal experience. He was one of them. He was one of those Israelites who had a zeal for God, but not in according to knowledge. That's why it's so important that we study and understand what the Bible says about salvation and faith, because the knowledge, again, it's not just head knowledge. It has to begin with head knowledge. We have to understand it, and then we have to apply it and believe it and trust in it. But it begins with knowledge. 
Paul said they had great zeal, but they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't understand what was going on here. This is the case in my own personal testimony. I had grown up in the church. I had been in the church for seven, almost 17 years. I knew all the Bible stories. I went to VBS. I was taught all the things in the, in, that you're taught about the Bible as a child growing up. I was in the church, but I didn't have the knowledge of faith. So when I was, I was almost 17 years old and somebody sat down with me and they, they asked me this question, and this is the question that changed my life, and this is the question that I try to ask as many other people as I can. And, and the, it was a fellow teenager, and they just asked me simply, if you were standing before God and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And that's such a powerful question because it, it pinpoints exactly what you're trusting in. And again, I had grown up in the church. Every Sunday, camps, etc., etc. But I told them, my answer to that question was, of course I'm going to heaven because I'm pretty good. I'm better than, than most. I was like that Pharisee who looked down on others and thought, well, at least I'm not like them. Surely God's going to accept me. And so I didn't even have, 17 years in the church, I didn't have the knowledge of what faith is. I had faith, but faith in the wrong thing. Faith in what I could do. What I had done. So this knowledge, this understanding of faith is so uh, important. Well, that fellow teenager at the time explained that if I was going to get to heaven on my own, to do that, I would have to be perfect. I would have to obey all the commands all the time, my entire life. And obviously that's hopeless because none of us can do that. Paul's saying the same thing here. He's quoting Moses, actually, where Moses said, after giving the law, He said, the one who does these things, verse 5, this righteousness that you can get from the law, hypothetically, you only receive this righteousness from the law if you live by them, if you actually do them all perfectly. The one who does these things must live by them, in verse 5. Righteousness from the law, you can achieve it only if you live it perfectly. But the problem is nobody does. The problem is we all fail to live up to this perfect standard. And so it says in verse 4 that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. As Christ himself explained, he didn't come to obliterate the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. And he did that by living it out perfectly. He did what we couldn't do. And we can have his righteousness applied to us when we trust him. That's the transaction. We trust in Him, and then His righteousness is covered over us. So when God looks at us, He sees the righteousness of Christ. Now the next thing that Paul is going to point out here, verses 6 through 8, is that this faith in Christ is within reach. Okay, It's not something way out there. You have to you know, go on a, a huge a trek to find it. It's right there within your reach. Take a look at verse 6. Romans 10.6. Paul says, The righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven. He's quoting Moses again here, and I'll explain the context of, of what, why Moses said these things in a minute. Moses um, said, The one who does these things... Oh, I'm sorry, drop down to verse 6. Don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven that is to bring Christ down, Paul explains, or who will go down into the abyss, again quoting Moses, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? Quoting from the Old Testament. The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Now Paul is quoting Moses here uh, several times in this passage. And he's quoting from a time where uh, Moses gave the law. Okay, so you can picture in your mind, Moses comes down from the mountain and he has God's law for the Israelites. And Moses said these things. He said, look, 
here are God's moral requirements. You don't have to go climb a mountain. I've done that already. You don't have to go find a wise man somewhere. You don't need to look for some religious experience or wait for a bolt of lightning. No, God's law is laid out right here. Here are the the Ten Commandments, so to speak. They're right here. They're available. Everybody can see them. You can read them. You know what they are. It's not some mystical thing. They're right here within your grasp. And Paul is quoting Moses to say the same thing about faith. That it's not some, you don't, I I try to help people understand, look, to become a Christian, you don't need to have some great religious experience. I mean, if you do, that's great, that's fine, but that's not what you need. You You don't need to have some great uh, feeling. And if you do, that's fine, but that's not, you don't need that. You don't need to hike up a mountain. You don't need to have, faith isn't some esoteric, mystical thing. It's very simple. It's, it's right here next to us. You can make the decision to trust in Christ just sitting in a chair, at home watching TV, stuck in traffic on the interstate. I mean, you don't have to go someplace special to do this. Faith in Christ is a simple thing. You can do it. It's just a decision to trust in Christ. It's right there next to you. It's within your grasp. That's what Paul's trying to get across here. It's not a hidden message. It's not a secret. It's out there. It's available to everyone. And it's so simple. He goes on to explain exactly how to do it. Pick up again in verse 8. Romans 10.8, pick up in the middle of the verse. Paul says, this is the message of faith that we proclaim. Here it is. Are you ready? Paul says, this is the message. This is faith. This is what you do. It's not some religious experience that you're waiting for. All you have to do is this. Verse 9, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's it. That's all there is to it. Verse 10, he explains, with the heart one believes, resulting in righteousness, that's the righteousness of Christ that comes on you then, when you trust in Him, you believe in Him, you put your faith in Him, and then with the mouth one confesses, resulting in salvation. It's such a a simple thing. I often use the um, example of marriage. I think, and the Bible does as well, it's not something I came up with, but I think, Uh, marriage is just such a great illustration of this decision because when you marry someone, that's what you do. You trust them. You decide to trust. You don't do it blindly. You just don't walk down the street and see somebody and say, oh, I'm going to trust in you as my spouse. We're we're married. No, that would be a blind. You had no information about that person. No, when, when you trust in somebody as your spouse, you get to know them. You find out things about them. And then if you go um, that next step, you decide to trust them. You decide to put your faith in them and they in you. And you, you enter into that marriage covenant. It's a person-to-person trust relationship based on faith and trust. But it's a choice you make. It's the same thing with Christ. We learn about Him. We see Him. We study the Scripture. We get information about Him. We don't make this decision blindly. We can ask questions and say, well, how do we know He's really the Messiah? How do we know He is who He claims to be? We can ask questions. We can learn things about Him. But there comes a time where you make that decision. And it's a decision to trust a person. It's a decision to say, I'm going to choose not to trust myself, not to put my faith in myself, to put my faith in Him and what He's done for me. That's what faith is. Now, as as Paul explains, part of faith is confessing Jesus as Lord. And we want to be careful here because as I see it, sometimes we can cause confusion when we talk about repentance. Now, we don't mean to. That's not our intention. But sometimes, and I've done it myself, I'm trying to communicate the gospel to somebody and I say things about repentance or I use the word repent and I might say something to the effect of you have to uh, turn from your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, which is true, completely true. But sometimes when we say things like that and other things we might say, the person, that's not what the person hears. When we talk about um, uh, commitment, we talk about um, lordship, maybe we talk about repentance sometimes, and it comes across to some people what they hear by which all those things are true, 
But what sometimes people hear from those things is that they have to fix their life first and then trust in Christ. That they've got to put some things together on their own. And that's not what we're saying. That's not what we mean by those things. But that's what they hear. That you have to remember that as human beings, we are just, it seems like because of our sinful, rebellious ways, we are ingrained with this idea that we have to work for it. And so we've just got to be so clear when we explain the gospel to people that that's not what we mean when we talk about repentance. I found a very helpful way to do it is to, to use the word surrender. That when you come to Christ, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's trusting in what He did for you, but there's also a surrendering that goes on. There's a surrendering where, look, you come as you are. You can't come any other way. You can't fix your life. You can't make things right and then come to God. No, you come just as you are, just as the Billy Graham song says. You have to come just as you are. You can't fix anything on your own first. But when you come to Christ, you must be willing to surrender your life. You must be willing to allow God to come in and change your life. And if you aren't willing, if you aren't willing to surrender, if you aren't willing to have God change you, then you're not ready to trust in Him. Because that's what will happen. We've got to make it crystal clear that when you trust in Christ, He will radically change your life. And if you're not ready for that change, then you're not ready to trust Him as your Savior. We need to explain that it's not a matter of the person changing their life because they can't. They come just as they are. But they need to, as part of their trusting in Christ, to surrender to Him as Lord because He will change their life if they choose to trust Him. Well, the last thing that Paul covers is the promises of faith. The promises of faith in Christ are offered to all. Take a look at verse 11. These are our last set of verses for this morning. We'll be done. Paul says, Now the Scripture says, No one who believes on Him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. And here's one of our theme verses. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, he said there's no distinction here between uh, Jew and Gentile, or Greek. Uh, He's just using the term Greek to to refer to all Gentiles, all non-Israelites. But don't read into this that there there are no distinctions whatsoever. Of course there's distinctions. He talked about in chapter 9 about Uh, Israel has been the recipients of all these national blessings. So there are distinctions. In what sense is there no distinction? Paul is making a very specific point here, and he said there is no distinction between them in this sense, in the sense that both Israelites and non-Israelites have to come to God on faith, in faith. Faith in Christ is the only thing that will save them. In that sense, there is no distinction. Well, I hope you're amazed. I hope you're encouraged by God and His plan to rescue us. I I, I find it incredible to see how God has orchestrated the events, how He's used, I would say, free will choices and incorporated them in His plan to accomplish what He wants to do in rescuing the human race. But then I step back and I think, Isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God to take something that's broken and evil? I mean, I feel that's what He's done in my own life. To take something broken and evil and to offer it life. To take something broken and evil like the the Israelites condemning and crucifying and murdering their own Savior, Messiah, King, and taking that and using that to offer life to all. The beautiful thing is that he does it one life at a time. That's the good news. That's, that's really the good news that gets us so excited. That's why we want to have a hundred children coming through our doors so that we can explain to them this good news. We, we should love to be the bearer of good news. I think of the opposite. I mean, none of us like to be the bearer of bad news, right? I feel so sorry for those. Maybe some of you are, are like this, so I apologize, but those who have to work as uh, like a bill collector or the, the folks that work at the airport that 
um, deal with lost luggage. I mean, you just you have nothing but bad news for people, right? All day, your luggage is lost, your luggage is lost. I mean, nobody likes to talk to you because you're the bearer of bad news. But think about the people who, um, and I'd love this job, to go around and tell people that they're the ones who have won a million dollars. I mean, people are going <laughs> to love you. They're going to want to hug you, and they're going to be excited, and you will rush to tell them because it's good news. And that's what we have here. We have a, a greater message than you've won a million dollars. You have one, not, not, not one, but you can receive righteousness, eternal, perfect righteousness on your account for free by trusting in Christ. It's such great news. And I pray as we study through this, as we work through this, that, that, that we start to see ourselves as the bearer of this good news, that we would see our errands, our daily trips, our daily interactions with people as opportunities to share, to be the bearer of good news, because that's what this is. It is good news that righteousness is available to all. Now, we always have to close a message like this with that question. As I said, I don't want to take anything for granted. I was in the church for 17 years, and I did not have the knowledge necessary for salvation. So I want to make sure it's crystal clear and provide you this opportunity that if maybe you had, had been trusting in the wrong thing, if your faith was in yourself, if you thought you were going to heaven because you were pretty good or better than most or better than some at least, that's wrong. Your faith is in the wrong thing. And here's an opportunity. You don't need a bolt of lightning. You don't need to go on a, a mystical experience. You don't need to look for it. It's right here. The message of faith is simple. You can make that decision to trust in Christ anytime, anywhere. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Your Word. It's encouraging to me the way that You lay it out so simply for us that, Lord, it's not something we have to search for. It's not something we have to climb a mountain for. This message is so simple, it's so accessible, it's within reach, it's right here. You've made it so simple because you love us and you want us to trust in you. You desire all men and women to be saved and come to the knowledge, this knowledge of the truth. I pray that that's what, would, what we would be about as a church, as families, as individuals, that we would be the bearers of this good news, that as we bring a hundred children through our doors, that we would love them and teach them your truth. That we would be so familiar and understand the truth so well that we can communicate it in a moment. That we don't have to think it through. That it's on the tip of our tongue, so to speak. That we can just rattle it off out of love for the person. So we can show them, explain to them, the simple step of faith that they must take to trust in you and receive the righteousness of Christ to be reconciled back to you, their Father. Very simple. It can be done this morning. It can be done anytime, any place. I pray for anybody here this morning who has yet to make that decision that you would soften their hearts, prepare them, draw them to yourself in a mighty way. In your name we pray.